Well, this morning we are going to continue uh, the series we've been looking at uh, through so far this year. It's a series that, that's called Back to the Future. And so kind of spinning off the movie from, from 1985 that became a, a trilogy uh, about uh, them making a time machine, going back uh, in time, and then coming back uh, to the, the time when uh, the young man, Marty, was living and the things that they, they learned and different things within that. And so what we've been doing is, as Christians, as a church, going back because we have God's word. And so when you look at the Bible, it's not like a lot of books we have. There's a lot of books on history that I think is very important to go back and, and read. But the Bible is different, even though there's a lot of historical things, because Christianity is real, okay? It's in real time, real space, real people, uh, God interacting with people. So that's why you can always trace it, because it goes back to the beginning. But also we see, as we believe, as Scripture says, that all Scripture is inspired by God. So all the Bible we see is inspired. It is the breath of God being given to us. And so it's very important because God's not continuing to give us more Scripture, right? We see that it, it, it ended with the book of Revelation, Probably the last book we have within the Bible is, is last in where it's placed, but it's probably the last as far as the time period that it was given to us. And so this is what we need to know how we live with God, interact with other people, what he wants us to do. So it's very important for us to go back to the early church to help us to see how the church today is to be. And so it is neat that we have these foundational things that help us. And so we need to constantly be going back. And that's why so often you probably hear we need to be people of the book, okay? We need to know God's word because it helps us in everyday life, but also helps us as we, we live today, also as we pass things on uh, to the church tomorrow. So we've been looking at this and Today is part number six, as we look at this series going through Acts chapter one through chapter six. And so I want to recap just a little bit of where we have been uh, so far. So just kind of going back to week number one, we were in Acts chapter one, where Jesus was getting ready to go up into heaven. The apostles are around and some of the other disciples probably could be 120 people there. And Jesus ascends back to, to heaven, his place of authority, where he came from. And basically, he tells them, he gave them a mission, okay? So we as people, we have a mission, as he told them to be my witnesses. And then he, he said other things there, and so I won't repeat the sermon, but it's the aspect that we have a mission. So we are here as believers with a mission, and then the second week, we were in Acts chapter 2, just those first few verses, and we see that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. We see the Holy Spirit came, as Jesus said, go to Jerusalem and wait, and the Holy Spirit came with power. We see uh, there is an aspect of the filling of the Holy Spirit that is taking place, but also for those that believed and repented that were baptized, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then they were to continue as well to walk, to be led by God, and to continue to be filled by the Spirit as well. And then week number three, we looked also in Acts chapter two, looking at salvation. As the apostles preached, and then the focus comes upon Peter preaching that there are people there. They were eyewitnesses to the death, burial, and resurrection because that was only 50 days earlier uh, in the same place. It's in Jerusalem. And so that they, they see they are convicted of what took place because they were participants. And so they ask, what can we do? To them, it looked hopeless. God sent the Messiah and we killed the Messiah. But Peter tells them, you know, that they need to repent, be baptized. They will be forgiven of their sins. They receive the Holy Spirit and they are added. Okay? And so we, we see that within it, salvation. Week number four, 
uh, we looked at also in Acts chapter 2, the church at its best. The church at its best is ones that look to the apostles' teaching. So we would say scripture, okay? We look to God's word. We're directed by that. We see they had times of fellowship, sometimes coming together, sometimes in one another's homes as they ate meals together. They had uh, the Lord's Supper to, together. We see they had prayer together, that also they sacrificed for one another. They had a lot of gratitude and helped one another. And because of that, the people within the community looked at them with favor. That's the church at its best. Today, we're going to be looking at facing opposition. That's chapter five. And then next week, we'll be looking at sharing the load, which is chapter six. So if you have your Bibles, or if you use your, your phone, or if you want to look on the screen, we're going to be looking at a big hunk of Acts chapter five. And so what we're going to be looking at is how we live in face of opposition, okay? And so if you, you look at the screen, uh, there's going to, to be a lot of scripture today we're going to be looking at. So Amanda is going to wear out her finger probably back there, hitting more and more and more of them, okay? But as we, before we jump into that, I want you to think about a time where it cost you something as a follower of Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking so much financial cost, even though sometimes opposition brings financial loss. But when was a time because of opposition? It could have been in the workplace. It could have been in the neighborhood, family, sports. There's uh, any area of life it could have taken place in. How about you? Where, where was that? What took place? And, you know, how did you handle it? How did you handle it? And that's where we're going today. You know, opposition comes. That doesn't mean we always handle it well, okay? But how did you handle it? Because as we look at Acts chapter 5, the church is around long enough that some of the people are becoming pretty bold that oppose Jesus, okay? Now they're opposing the disciples, but also they are very careful because as we've already looked at, the people in Jerusalem by and large kind of like the Christians, okay? Because they see a lot of godliness within their, their lives. They're in favor. And so those that are opposing sometimes have to be very careful in how they're doing it, okay? They, they, they want to switch, a wave, just like with Jesus. He was popular at one time too, and they worked through that where they had the whole crowd within a week saying, Hosanna to crucify him, okay? So that's the way they, they are working there. So let's look at Acts chapter 5, starting with, with verse 12. It says, The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers were meeting regularly at the temple in the area known as Sol Solomon's uh, Colonnade. But no one else dared to join them, even though the people had high regard for them. Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord, crowds of both men and women. As a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats that Peter shadowed might fall across some of them as he went by. Crowds came from villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. The high priest and his officials, uh, who were Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in, a, in the public jail. But an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the gates of the jail, and brought them out, then he told them, go to the temple and give the people this message of life. So at daybreak, the apostles entered the temple as they were told, and immediately they began teaching. When the high priest and his officials arrived, they, they convened the high council, the full assembly of elders of Israel. They sent for the apostles to be brought from the jail for trial. But when the temple guards went to the jail, the men were gone. So they re-entered the, returned to the council and reported. The jail was securely locked, 
with guards standing outside, and when we opened the gates, no one was there. When the captain of the temple guard and the leading priest heard this, they were perplexed, wondering where it would, would all end. Then some arrived with startling news. The men you put in jail are standing in the temple teaching the people. The captain went to his temple guards and arrested the apostles and without violence, for they were afraid that the people would stone them. Then they brought the apostles before the high council where the high priest confronted them. We gave you strict orders never again to teach in this man's name, uh, he said. Instead, you have filled all Jerusalem with your teaching about him and you want to make us responsible for his death. But Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on a cross. Then God put him in the place of honor and his, at his right hand as prince and savior. He did this so the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We are witnesses of these things. And so in the Holy Spirit, who was given by God to those who obeyed. When they heard this, the high council was furious and decided to kill them. But one member, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, who was an expert in religious law and respected by all the people, stood up and ordered that the men be sent outside the council chamber for a while. Then he said to his colleagues, men of Israel, take care of what you're planning to do to these men. Some time ago, there was that fellow uh, Theodos who was pretending to be someone great. About 400 others joined him and he was killed and all followers went their various ways. The whole movement uh, came to nothing. After him, at the time of the census, there was a Judas of Galilee. He got people to follow him, but he was killed too and all his followers were scattered. So my advice, leave these men alone, let them go. If they are planning and doing these things merely on their own, it will soon be overthrown. But if it is from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even find yourselves fighting against God. The others accepted this advice. They called in the apostles and had them flogged. Then they ordered them never again to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. The apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they continued to teach and preach the message, Jesus is the Messiah. Look at verse 41 again. It says, the apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace from the name of Jesus. They weren't just in prison, they were flogged, okay? They took a beating and they left rejoicing. To me, that's a pretty strong statement. Rejoicing at opposition. I have to be honest, I don't usually rejoice when there's opposition. I say sometimes it's our response is to run from opposition or I'm going to beat opposition. I'm going to win, okay? Sometimes that's our response. But if we can learn anything from the early church about opposition, here it is, to help us in the 21st century church, that following Jesus, first of all, will result in opposition. There will always be opposition when you follow Jesus Christ. But today, for what some are teaching, that is just counter to what's being taught. There are many places that is being taught things like this. Come to Jesus and he will make your life great. No more struggles. Now, I do believe we are blessed, okay? I do believe we have a, a great eternal reward and also there's many blessings uh, throughout life. But I don't think we could ever find in Scripture that if we follow Jesus Christ, everything is going to be great. There's no struggles. For many years now, that's been called the health and wealth uh, 
gospel. Now, the gospel is good news, but it's not so much that he makes us healthy, wealthy, and wise by following the, the Lord Jesus Christ. We hear that from some TV preachers, not all, but some. And some of the best, some of the best selling uh, Christian books are this philosophy. Okay? But it's not true. We don't see it's true with the foundation of the church in the first century, okay? And if anything is going to, to go well, we see we already looked at the church at its best, right? It, it is working well. And for the most part, a lot of people are saying, we like these Christians, okay? But there was still opposition because we still have an adversary, don't we? And an adversary that was defeated at the resurrection, and our adversary is mad. And he knows he's going down, right? And so the only way he can get at God is he can get at God through us. And so there's opposition that, that comes. There's opposition that, that comes our way. So if you follow Jesus, you will face opposition. Okay? And some places we see it more so than we have here in the United States. But there will be opposition. When you live out your faith, when you don't cave, when we don't give in, when we don't back down, we will face opposition. Because that's what Jesus tells us. Okay? We can see it because it's evident. Okay? It, it, it is evident that this takes place in the world, uh, but also is true because Jesus said so. Jesus, as he was teaching his disciples, he said this. In John, in John, he says, If the world hates you, remember that they hated me first. And that's pretty big, isn't it? Okay, I'm going to go on in just a little bit. That's pretty big. Because remember, Jesus is the, the sinless one. You and I sin. Sometimes we can do things that aggravate people, right? Okay, don't raise your hand, right? We, we can do that. Sometimes we are wrong. But Jesus never was, but he was still opposed. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it. But you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world, so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. They will do all this to you because of me, for they have rejected the one who sent me. Now, that, doesn't that make sense? And that's the theme through Scripture too. You remember back with Moses, when there were people opposing Moses? God kind of said, Moses, you know, this is a paraphrase. Calm down, Moses. It's not about you, it's about me. They oppose me. Okay, so let me handle it. Okay? And so we see that, that's what Jesus is saying. They oppose me because they're against God. So they will oppose you in the, in the same way. And so this is what Jesus is saying. This is a normal thing for followers of Jesus Christ. We see the Apostle Paul taught the same thing to his young student, Timothy. He wrote this in 2 Timothy, we have. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. How many? Everyone, okay? So it, it will come some time. That doesn't mean it will be as much and severe as the Apostle Paul received or Jesus received, but it will come. Now you're probably thinking about now, oh, I'm glad I came to church today, Okay? We get to hear about suffering, okay? Thanks, preacher, for picking my week up, okay? But it's true. But it's true. But we always have to remember all the blessings, right? Kind of as Danny, Danny was saying, think how many breaths of the air we get, the blessing of God. We are blessed. Even though we face opposition. And so in Acts chapter 5, this is what's happening to the apostles. It's what's happening. Uh, that they just left the high council and they were rejoicing. And why did they rejoice? Because 
I got to be living like Jesus. Jesus suffered for doing what God wanted, and I am suffering that they can see this. And because it was seen within their life, many of the Jewish people were becoming followers of Jesus Christ. So it was working. It could be seen, and those that are opposing God are, are just going to reject it. But many others were coming. And so they rejoice. They rejoice because there's a difference. To the extent, it seems like they were looking at if we weren't being opposed, are we living the life that we should be? Okay, because Jesus was opposed and they were with him, okay? They were with him through Jesus' ministry. And so it's just natural that we are opposed. So when you live... Lives that are different than the world's, you will come up against opposition. From whom? We see the high priest were the ones there. Why? Because they were jealous. They were jealous. And that's part of it. They were jealous. You say jealous over what? It started out there in that passage in chapter 5 is that the, the apostles were going around and Power was being seen within their lives. They were doing miracles. They were doing signs. They were doing wonders. And people that were sick were being healed. Okay? People with evil spirits were having them cast out. People were bringing sick from all over the, the countryside so that they would be healed. And the religious leaders could not stand that. Okay? They were threatened. Because they were the leaders, okay? And it says they were Sadducees. The Sadducees were, were the ones that basically ruled Jerusalem. The Pharisees ruled the rest of the country. But the Sadducees were the majority that was on the high council, the Sanhedrin. And, and so they're threatened. This is about power. This is about who we are. It's not so much about God. Because if they were worried about God, they would have treated the Messiah different, right? It's about power. And now they are seeing they're losing the people again. We thought when we killed Jesus, okay, all that would change. That the people would come back to us. But now, his followers, we see what's happening. But also, as you know, and we have talked about before, when you live a godly life, your life is like a mirror. So when people look at you, and see godliness, you are like a mirror. You reflect back who they are. And some people don't like who they are. They know they are wrong. They, they understand that, and you're reflecting that back to them. And so there's only things they can, two things that can be done. Either change, okay, so that the reflection will be different, so it is more like Jesus Christ, or they will smash the mirror. Those two things happen. So we see that. On the day of Pentecost, we see a lot of the people didn't like the reflections. So they said, what can we do for this to be changed? Well, we repent and be baptized. So many of them did. But others want to smash the mirror. Because that's what happens when systems collide, when there's opposition. It happens in a lot of different ways, right? It happens in a lot of different ways. Uh, back a few months ago, and now it's been quite a few months ago when we were going through the series in Sunday school class on the book of Revelation, uh, where we looked at Shane Wood teaching us. One of the things Shane said, as you look at the book of Revelation and what was taking place against the Christians there, he said this, and it just makes a lot of sense. When there are two opposing groups trying to occupy the same space, there's always going to be trouble, right? There's always going to be opposition. When you have two opposing groups trying to be in the same spot, there's always going to be trouble. Now the most obvious question is, do you see that in our country? Sure. We see it in our country in so many different ways. Pro-life versus pro-choice. And this is the only one that you'll get a commentary on because it's different than the, than the other aspects. 
pro-life, pro-choice? Is it about life? Is life about life or is it about liberation? And you can digest that. Some of those that, that I won't give you commentary on, mask or no mask, okay? There's a lot of different stuff there. And I won't say two masks, three masks. I won't even go there, okay? CNN or Fox? Is it global warming that is all caused by man or is it climate change? Big difference until so there's a war because of it. Who for president? Right? Who for president? And so we see there is probably one of the most obvious trying to occupy the same spots. We see there's opposition. And kind of opposition like we have never seen before, right? And the apostles saw that when it came to following Jesus. Two kingdoms trying to possess the same spot. Right? So as we, we see it, when two belief systems collide... Sometimes it can be pretty big. See, the reality is you will face this every day of the rest of your life because of being a Christ follower. We live by a fundamentally different perspective than the world. We live in an upside down kingdom, we might say, when you look at the rest of the world. It's upside down why Christians have suffered a lot of times. One, because... The greatest is the least. That doesn't work, does it? Where the way up is down. Where servanthood is the highest form of leadership there is. Because see, we live with a view of eternity and not just this world. So there will always be opposition because it collides with everything this world says. And so... Sometimes people in the world, they will change, and other times they try to break the mirror. So the question is not, how do we avoid situations of opposition? The question is, how do we handle ourselves in the midst of opposition? Right? Look at what Jesus taught, part of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is, is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that, but you are to be perfect. How perfect? Even as your Father in heaven is perfect. See, that's our goal. We look at God. That's my goal, to be like God my heavenly father, that I will reflect that back. So I will reflect that back because many people, then when they look at themselves in the mirror of my life, they will want change. They will want Jesus. And then their whole life changes, their whole eternity late changes. The apostle Paul speaks directly to this, how we are to respond to opposition. In Romans 12, he says, blessed are those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Pretty good one. Also in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this, facing opposition. God blesses those who are, are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad. For a great reward awaits you in heaven. 
And remember, the ancient prophets were uh, persecuted in the same way. So make the note there is when you're persecuted for doing godliness, for doing the right thing. See, sometimes we can be opposed because we're just annoying, okay? That's a, that's a different deal, okay? But it's because when we're doing things the way God wants us to do things, that, that's different. Like Peter said in his letters to the churches in 1 Peter 4, so be happy when you are insulted for being a Christian. For the glorious spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, uh, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. But it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. And then also he writes a little bit further in, in his letter. If you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to God who created you for he will never fail you. I like that. Did God fail Jesus? Jesus rose from the dead and his name will be above every name, right? Every tongue will confess, every knee will bow. So when your allegiance is clear, it makes a difference. See, when your allegiance is fear that I basically my fear of people is second to my love for God. And then you'll be able to stand in face of whatever opposition that takes place. This is what is happening with the, the apostles. This is what's happening as we see this is the way the church is to continue to be, to keep standing up. See, this is the story of the, the early church in Acts. This is the story of the Apostle Paul who moved from a Christian killer to a Christian preacher. Okay? Because he saw himself in the mirror and he decided to change. And here's another overall principle that Paul gives to us in 2 Corinthians 6 eight. We serve God whether people honor us or despise us. I like that. We just follow God. No matter what their earthly results are going to be, we keep following him because God is faithful. God is faithful because we are following the one who the world has rejected and so whenever our life is giving testimony to that, we will have opposition like he was opposed. I want to close with a story and then a couple passages. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a man that, that probably some of you know some about. He, he wrote a lot of books, probably his most known book is The Cost of Discipleship. It is very much worthy to read. Most of Bonhoeffer's stuff, it's just things, if you have the opportunity, make sure you read Bonhoeffer's stuff. There's some uh, documentary movies about him. Bonhoeffer was a, an interesting guy. He was a German. And he, basically, he opposed the state church in a time when the Nazis were, were basically taking control of everything within Germany and then later trying to take control of everything within the world. He opposed the state church because the state church was, was soft. And so there was kind of the, you might call the underground church that, that was there working, even though they weren't underground, they were quite visible. And Bonhoeffer was there. He opposed the Nazis. And he had the opportunity through World War II to stay in the United States, but he did not because he felt he was needed in Germany. So he went there and he continued to preach. He continued to teach. He was a professor. Eventually he was imprisoned because he opposed the Nazis. And he was friends and working with some of those that, if you understand if you saw the movie Valkyrie, okay, he was one of those within that aspect when they try to uh, get rid of Hitler. So he was imprisoned. All sorts of things happened to him. 
while he was in, in prison, but in 1945, he was executed. Just a few days before the Allied forces got there, because one of the things Hitler did was anyone that opposed him, you were killed, okay? Right before, he knew he was going to lose, okay? But all those that were still in prison, they were just wiped out. And he was one of those, just a few days before he would have had freedom. But it was the fulfillment of basically what he believed and, ta he believed and taught. Here's part of what Bonhoeffer said. Suffering is the badge of true discipleship. The disciple is not above his master. Following Christ means suffering. This is why Martin Luther reckoned suffering among the, the marks of the true church and the one memoranda drawn up by the preparation for the Augsburg Confession similarly defines the church as a community of those who are persecuted and martyred for the gospel's sake. The discipleship means allegiance to the suffering Christ. And it is therefore not at all surprising that Christians should be called upon to suffer. And so that's the way he lived. He could have been here in the United States through the whole war. But no, I need to be where I'm influencing Christians. He could have tried to stay under the radar, but he did not. He stayed public. And he suffered because of that. He was a witness. It's interesting, maybe you don't know the word witness in Scripture is the same word as martyr, okay? It's the same word. A witness is a martyr. That so often you will sacrifice your life. So back to our Scripture text. And the apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple, from house to house, they continued to teach and preach this message, Jesus is the Messiah. May this church family, may you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, stand strong in face of opposition. May our lives be lived out with confidence, and may that life of confidence draw other people to the one who suffered and paid the ultimate price for us. As the worship team comes up, I want to read one more passage from Romans chapter 8. It was read last week uh, for us during the communion time. It says this by the Apostle Paul, one that knew suffering. I am convinced that nothing, nothing, nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, my, our Lord. Let's stand.